This is what happened when Israel built a 130-kilometer artificial river system that pumped water uphill from 213 meters below sea level, transformed 60% of desert land into farmland, and eventually reversed direction to flow backwards. The national water carrier consumed 5% of the nation's GDP and employed one in every 14 able-bodied Israelis during construction. Today, that same system feeds water in the opposite direction, pumping desalinated seawater back into the freshwater lake it was originally built to drain. And if you stick around until the end, you'll see how this entire system started flowing backwards in 2025, something nobody saw coming. Drop a like and subscribe if you want more stories about engineering that seemed impossible. The basic problem came down to geography and survival. Most Israelis in 1948 lived near the coast around Tel Aviv, but the country's freshwater sat 130 kilometers away in the Sea of Galilee, which wasn't just distant but 213 meters below sea level. 60% of the land was desert, and you can't grow food, build cities, or survive without water. Large-scale water infrastructure had been on people's minds for decades before construction ever started. Theodor Herzl imagined it as essential for a future Jewish state back in 1902, but the real architect turned out to be Simcha Blas, a Polish-born engineer who co-founded Mekarot in February 1937 alongside two men who would later become political heavyweights, Levi Eshkol, the future prime minister, and Pinchas Sapir, the future finance minister. Blas had already demonstrated what was possible nine years after founding Mekarot. Using salvaged pipes from London Blitz firefighting equipment, he built the first water pipeline to the Negev Desert in 1946, and that single pipeline enabled 11 settlements to spring up in the desert on a single night. Water could go where it seemed impossible, and people could follow. Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion wanted something far more ambitious than a single pipeline. The formal decision to build the national water carrier came in 1951, and by 1952, the government had established Tehal, Water Planning for Israel, to design it. Regional cooperation looked possible for a brief window between 1954 and 1957 when an American water envoy named Eric Johnston tried brokering a plan to share water resources between Israel, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Politics killed it, which meant Israel would build the system alone. Construction started in 1959, and the numbers alone tell you how massive this undertaking was. More than 4,000 workers showed up at peak construction to build 130 kilometers of infrastructure, 87 kilometers of steel and concrete pipelines, 13 kilometers of tunnels carved by hand through mountains, and 8 kilometers of open canals. The main pipeline measured 108 inches in diameter, which works out to 2.74 meters, wide enough that you could technically drive a small car through it if you wanted to. The engineering challenge sounds almost absurd when you break it down. Water starts at the Sea of Galilee, at 213 meters below sea level, then needs to climb over terrain reaching 44 meters above sea level, which adds up to an elevation gain of roughly 257 meters. You're essentially lifting a river uphill. Three massive pumps at the Sapir pumping station became the muscle of the entire operation, each one generating 30,000 horsepower to move 6.75 cubic meters of water per second. That flow rate matches what you'd see in a medium-sized natural river, except this one was climbing a mountain. The solutions engineers came up with show you what happens when failure isn't an option. Deep wadis, those are dry riverbeds that can drop hundreds of meters, got crossed using inverted siphons, which are U-shaped steel pipes that rely on the principle of communicating vessels. At Nahalamud, one of these siphons descended 150 meters. The Yaakov Tunnel stretched 850 meters through solid rock, 3 meters in diameter, carved entirely by hand. The intake system at the Sea of Galilee required some creative thinking. Engineers floated nine pipes joined by internal cable onto the lake, each pipe containing 12 concrete pipes encased in steel, then sealed everything and deliberately sank it into position. A star-shaped cap allowed water to flow in from multiple directions. Building all of this cost 420 million Israeli lira, which adjusts to roughly $4 billion in today's money. For a young nation with a tiny economy, this was betting everything on one project. June 10, 1964, marked the day the first water got pumped from the Sea of Galilee, but there was no celebration. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol, the same man who had co-founded Mekarot with Simcha Blas 27 years earlier, 
held only a private inauguration because he feared a public ceremony would provoke Syria into military action. The strategic importance of the national water carrier made it a threat in the eyes of neighboring countries, and Syria did attempt to divert the headwaters of the Jordan River in response. Those tensions fed directly into the 1967 Six-Day War. At full capacity, the national water carrier could move 320 million cubic meters of water annually, which revolutionized agriculture and enabled southern cities to grow. Ben-Gurion had predicted in 1959 that 500,000 people would live in the Negev by 1968, and he got it basically right. Today, more than 500,000 people live there across over 250 agricultural settlements. But here's what the national water carrier created alongside all that growth, complete dependence on one water source. The Sea of Galilee is finite, drought years meant dropping water levels, and by the early 2000s Israel was extracting so much that the lake approached crisis levels. They needed to create water that didn't exist yet. Desalination, turning seawater into drinking water, became the answer, and Israel's relationship with it actually started. In 1961, when desalination plants LTD was established with an inventor named Alexander Zarkin, that company evolved into IDE Technologies by 1965 and now operates over 500 plants in 40 countries. The real breakthrough came from Sidney Loeb, an American scientist who developed practical semi-permeable membranes with his colleague Srinivasa Surirajan in the late 1950s. Reverse osmosis works by pushing seawater through extremely fine filters that trap salt molecules while letting fresh water through, and Loeb made it commercially viable. He taught at Ben Gurion University from 1967 to 1982 and sold his patent, the patent that created a multi billion dollar industry, for just $14,000. Eilat got Israel's first reverse osmosis plant in 1997, but it was small scale. The severe drought of 2002 forced the government to approve large-scale seawater desalination, and that's when everything changed. Ashkelon opened in 2005, producing 118 million cubic meters annually for about $250 million. Palmachim came in 2007 with 90 million cubic meters, followed by Hedera in 2009 with 127 million cubic meters at a cost of around $400 million. Soreki in 2013 changed the game entirely, producing 150 to 175 million cubic meters annually for $489 million. It was the first plant to use 16-inch vertical membrane pressure vessels instead of the standard 8-inch size. That one change cut the number of vessels needed by 76%, and MIT Technology Review named it one of their top 10 breakthrough technologies of 2015. Ashdod added 100 million cubic meters of capacity in 2015, and then Sorek II came online in 2024. This plant produces 200 million cubic meters per year at 41 cents per cubic meter, the world record low price. Back in 2005, Ashkelon was producing water at about 53 cents per cubic meter, which means in less than 20 years, Israel cut the cost by more than 20% while scaling up production massively. Sorek II achieved this using steam-driven high-pressure pumps instead of electric drives, saving 8-10% to on energy while cutting the carbon footprint by 30%, 120,000 tons of CO2 saved every year. The Israeli government called Sorek II's price a new benchmark for seawater desalination water prices on a global scale. Today's numbers sound almost impossible. Israel produces approximately 800 million cubic meters of desalinated water every year, which represents 80 to 86 percent of all drinking water in the country. 80 percent of Israel's drinking water comes from the ocean. Tema Zanberg, Israel's environmental protection minister, described the shift this way. Throughout my childhood, early adulthood, and really up until about five years ago, we were all traumatized by television advertising campaigns telling us to conserve water. Now though, the campaigns have stopped. Desalination means that we are not so worried about running out of water. Water recycling tells the other half of the story, and Israel dominates this category by a ridiculous margin. The country recycles 87-90% to 90 of its wastewater, the highest rate in the world by a factor of four. Spain ranks second at 20 to 30 percent, while the United States recycles only 8 to 10 percent. This recycled water accounts for about 50 percent of all water used by Israeli farmers and represents roughly 25 percent of Israel's total water supply, with annual volumes running between 473 and 546 million cubic meters.
The Dan Region Wastewater Treatment Plant near Tel Aviv, called Shafdan, processes 97 million gallons per day and treats 100% of Tel Aviv's metropolitan sewage. The treated water irrigates 60% of agriculture in the Negev Desert, and in 2012, the United Nations cited Shafdan as a global model. Since the 2000s, Israel has invested more than $750 million building 120 wastewater treatment plants nationwide. Gilad Erdan, Israel's Minister of Strategic Affairs, put it simply, Today, nearly 90% of our wastewater is recycled. That's around four times higher than any other country in the world. And this is where we circle back to Simsha Blas, the engineer who helped build the national water carrier, because he had one more innovation that would reshape agriculture worldwide. Back in the early 1930s, Blas noticed something odd, a large tree growing vigorously near a leaking pipe despite receiving no deliberate watering. He wrote in his autobiography, I became busy with other plans, but the drop of water that grew a gigantic tree refused to leave me. It stayed trapped and sleeping in my heart. After leaving government service in 1956, Blas spent the years between 1960 and 1965 turning that observation into the world's first commercial drip irrigation system. The agreement he signed in 1965 with Kibbutz Hatzerim in the Negev established Netafim, the world's first drip irrigation company, and the first commercial dripper hit the market in 1966. Simcha Blas died on July 18, 1982. Drip irrigation delivers water directly to plant roots through tubes with tiny emitters, which sounds simple until you compare the efficiency. Traditional flood irrigation wastes about 40% of water through runoff and evaporation, hitting only 60% efficiency. Drip irrigation reaches 90-95% to efficiency, which translates to 50-80% to water savings and can boost crop yields by up to 90%. Netafim today operates in 110 countries with 33 subsidiaries and over 5,000 employees controlling about 30% of the worldwide drip irrigation market with $1.38 billion in revenue for 2024. In August 2017, a company now called Orbia paid $1.5 billion for 80% of Netafim, and Blas's invention now helps feed farms in 150 countries. The impact inside Israel borders on unbelievable when you consider that 60% of the land is desert. More than 40% of vegetables and field crops now grow in the Negev and Arava regions, and the Arava Valley alone has 600 farms producing 60% of Israel's fresh vegetable exports and 90% of melon exports. About 90% of Arava produce gets exported, with 70% of agricultural land dedicated to peppers. Yields tell you just how far the technology pushed things. Israeli tomato production reaches 300 tons per hectare against a global average of 50 tons, six times higher. Israeli dairy cows produce 12,500 to 13,000 liters annually, double the European average of 6,000 liters. Between 1999 and 2009, Israeli farmers managed to grow 26% more produce using 12% less water. Israeli water technology exports now hit $2 to $2.2 billion annually, representing growth of nearly 200% over three years. About 300 companies and over 100 startups work in this sector, deploying technologies in more than 150 countries. But this success story carries controversies that can't be ignored. According to B'Tselem, an Israeli human rights organization, significant disparities exist in water access. Their 2023 report states that Israelis, including settlers, consume 247 liters per day on average, while Palestinians in the West Bank average 82.4 liters per day. Communities not connected to water networks consume only 26 liters per day, well below the World Health Organization's recommended minimum of 100 liters. But Selem states, in total, Israelis consumed 10 times the amount of water consumed by Palestinians in the West Bank in 2020, although the Israeli population is only three times larger. The Israeli government disputes these characterizations. Professor Haim Gewurzman argues, there is almost no difference in per capita consumption of natural water between Israelis and Palestinians, and Israeli officials claim they exceeded Oslo Accord obligations by making 70 million cubic meters per year available versus the 23.6 million required. They note that 96% of West Bank Palestinians connect to water networks, higher than many neighboring countries. The Oslo II Accord in 1995 established a joint water committee and recognized Palestinian water rights, 
while the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty in 1994 committed Israel to supplying 55 million cubic meters annually to Jordan, later expanded to 105 million cubic meters in 2021. An environmental crisis Israel hasn't solved involves the Dead Sea, which has dropped 45 meters in the past 50 years and continues declining 1 to 1.2 meters annually. Its surface area has shrunk from about 1,000 square kilometers in the 1950s to roughly 605 today. An historical inflow of 1,250 to 1,500 million cubic meters per year has collapsed to only 50 to 100 million cubic meters. Thousands of sinkholes now threaten infrastructure around the lake. A proposed Red Sea Dead Seawater Conveyance Project, a trilateral Israel-Jordan-Palestinian initiative from 2013, was abandoned by Jordan in June 2021. And that brings us to 2024 and 2025, when Israel faced a crisis that forced an extraordinary engineering reversal. The 2024 to 2025 winter became Israel's driest in recorded history, spanning approximately 100 years. Rainfall hit only 50% of average, with northern regions receiving just 30 to 45% of normal precipitation. The Sea of Galilee rose only 18 centimeters, the lowest increase ever recorded, and began declining in February, which had never happened before. As of October 2025, the Sea of Galilee sits at 213 to 25 meters below sea level, below the lower red line for the first time since 2017-2018. The Jordan River hit a record low flow of just 3.5 cubic meters per second. Yecheskel Lifshitz, director of Israel's Water Authority, described the situation in August 2025. This winter broke all records with the Sea of Galilee's water levels unchanged, an unprecedented event. We are in an emergency. October 8, 2025, marked a world first. Israel began pumping desalinated water from the Mediterranean coast into the Sea of Galilee via the Nahal Zalmon and Ein Ravid Spring, sending desalinated water from coastal plants 60 to 90 miles inland and uphill to refill the lake that the national water carrier was originally built to drain. This is the reverse water carrier project, the complete inversion of the original purpose. Amit Lang, CEO of Mekarot, framed it this way in September 2025. Our water system is the best in the world. Israel won't face water scarcity again thanks to desalination and innovation. The reversal carries a certain poetry. In 1964, Israel built an artificial river to move water from the Sea of Galilee south through the desert, and in 2025, they're using that infrastructure plus 60 years of additional engineering to do the opposite. The Mediterranean now feeds the Sea of Galilee, and the system flows both ways as needed. Construction continues. The Western Galilee desalination plant is being built with a delayed completion date of 2027, adding 100 million cubic meters annually as the first northern plant. The Emek Hefer plant sits in planning to produce 200 million cubic meters annually, and by 2050, Israel aims to produce 1.7 billion cubic meters of desalinated water per year. What changed the nation wasn't just one massive river, it was that river combined with technology that creates water from the sea, systems that recycle nearly everything, and irrigation that delivers every drop exactly where it needs to go. It was Simcha Blas spending 30 years thinking about water dripping near a tree, Levi Eshkol co-founding a water company in 1937, and living to see water flow through the carrier he helped build, and Sidney Loeb selling a $14,000 patent that became a billion-dollar industry. From one in 14 citizens working on infrastructure to running it backwards decades later. From water poverty to water surplus. From importing technology to exporting it to 150 countries. The massive river in the desert didn't just change Israel, it demonstrated that water scarcity can be engineered into abundance. And in 2025, when that river started flowing backwards, it proved something else. The best infrastructure isn't rigid, it adapts to whatever crisis comes next. Video de Guia, HTTPS, Chant, www.youtube.com, Shching Watch, Doa Bapuch Ash, Seik Yu, Siyuk X Favory, Satsuan Shem, Buscar otras fuentes y recursos.